A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be glorified in your sight. O oh God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Tis but thy name which is my enemy. Thou art thou self not a Montague. What is a Montague? It is not hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, to be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes, without that title. Romeo doth thy name, and for that name, which is no part of thee, take all of myself. What's in a name? As we are on the brink of heading back to school, there seemed no better way to begin this sermon than with a passage from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, which has haunted high school English classrooms since there were probably high school English classrooms. Thinking back to my own English class with Mrs. Daly, I remember how reader responses varied. Eyes rolled at the simplicity and rashness of this young couple's love. Voices became deep with emotions as powerful passages were read. And there were protests that Shakespeare said so little to our current world that it's outdated and the language, language is mere gibberish. Maybe you have found yourself having such a response, and I'm sure that there are many, many more responses. But whatever your thoughts on this play are, Juliet raises an important question. What's in a name? A name is not a physical part of us, as Juliet notes. It's not a hand or an arm or a foot, but names have enormous power. The power to bind together, as in marriage, or the power to separate, the power to create our identity, our very sense of self and being. We all live lives where we hold multiple names where we give names to ourselves and where others place names upon us. This issue of names is at the very root of today's gospel text. Within Matthew 16, we see the power Jesus places on names through his Socratic-like questioning of the disciples, asking them two questions. First, Jesus asks, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, I always found the term the Son of Man a little strange. Jesus using some third-person nickname to refer to himself. 
it's a little confusing. The term, the Son of Man, is used throughout all of the Gospels, though most predominantly it is found within the Gospel of Matthew. For the record, the Son of Man is found 30 times in Matthew, 25 in Luke, 14 in Mark, and 12 in John. This phrase, the Son of Man, or Son of Men, is also used throughout the Hebrew Bible. Within that context, it is typically used to talk about humanity as a whole. But within the Gospels, the phrase has a different meaning and refers specifically to Jesus typically being a way that Jesus actually refers to himself. Son of man is used to talk about three main things. One, Jesus' earthly existence, this experience and life here on earth. Two, Jesus' foreshadowing of his coming crucifixion and death. And three, Jesus uses the term son of man to talk about his final glory. Within Matthew 16, this seemingly self-imposed nickname, the Son of Man, points to Jesus' humanness. There is something incredibly powerful in that, that Jesus chose to focus on his humanity. This name that Jesus uses to refer to himself doesn't align him with God and the Most Holy. It doesn't allude to all of his power or all of the authority that he holds, but he chooses a name that aligns him with all of us. And this earthly, messy, confusing condition that we call humanity. Jesus, the Son of Man, and the Messiah. So in this first question in Matthew 16, 13 through 20, which was just read, Jesus is asking the disciples, who do people, who do strangers say that I am? The disciples respond, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. In short, people are saying that Jesus is anyone other than, well, Jesus. (laughs) In Talking with my friend Sarah, who's a Lutheran minister, about this text, she posed an interesting question. Do you think that Jesus ever got tired of being compared to those who came before him? Kind of in the same way you might grow tired when compared to your family. The endearingly annoying, oh my gosh, you're just like your Aunt Myrtle. Or the occasional exasperated, Oh, you remind me of your father. (laughs) Or the heartbreaking, why can you not be like your sister? We are part of lineages, tethered to communities that stretch in both directions. And Jesus, too, was part of a great lineage one of prophets, of those who came before him, bringing the word of God to the people of Israel. And yes, in many ways, Jesus was like those men. And yes, we are sometimes like our Aunt Myrtle, or our father, or we are not like our sister. But we are our own God-given person, as Jesus was his. Jesus asked, who do people say that I am? It is interesting what strangers say about us. Sometimes those a little removed have the opportunity to reveal great insight and give us names that those too close to us are too clouded to see. But sometimes we need to gather those closest to us around as Jesus did when he asked his second question in this passage. But who do you say that I am? Who do you, my friends, my fellow travelers, my disciples, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. 
in my mind's eye, I can see Jesus almost breathe a sigh of relief. Someone gets it. Someone gets me. We have all felt this. The comfort when someone knows us so well that we do not need to explain. We can just be. We can just be the people that God created us to be. In response, Jesus praises Simon Peter, saying, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Simon Peter has seen beyond others' comparisons, beyond the labels, to one of Jesus' God-given names. In return for Simon's declaration, Jesus blesses Simon and renames him Simon Peter. It is speculated that Simon had the nickname Petros, which is tied to Petra, which literally means rock, previous to this encounter. Some scholars hypothesize that Simon was a big man or particularly strong, which would make sense if he was a fisherman having to haul nets day in and day out. Other scholars hypothesize, and I kind of like this one, that Simon was a particularly stubborn man, rock or hard-headed, if you will. But in this passage, but it is in this passage that Jesus declares Simon Peter is the rock upon which the church will be built. And how incredible that this disciple, Simon Peter, is that rock. For Simon was by no means the favorite disciple, if there even was one. Simon was constantly misunderstanding Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. And it is Simon Peter who denies Christ three times during his crucifixion and death. But Jesus knew that Simon the Rock Peter was the rock upon which the church would be built. That this man who sometimes faltered and failed, that this stone, which might have been rejected, was the chief cornerstone for the future of Christianity. Jesus called Simon Peter by his God-given name. But today, I want to ask, what is the name by which God is calling us? I have a good friend named Alana who goes to parties armed with a question, one that is harmless and inviting, and it often turns superficial cocktail conversation into an opportunity for genuine relationship. Alana will ask, what is the name that you most identify with? It can be your first or your middle or your last name. It could be a nickname or a label that you feel truly reflects who you are. Well, what name would you pick? As summer ends, and we head back to school and to work in the coming weeks, we might be starting somewhere new, or we might be ready to fall back in with the old familiar routine. In the weeks ahead, we might find ourselves inundated with names. Student, teacher, friend, partner, sister, brother, parent, athlete, procrastinator, daughter, son, workaholic, bully, victim. Some of these names are ours. They're names that we have chosen to own. And others are names that have been forced upon us. As names become the, became the enemy for Juliet and Romeo, may we deny these false names, those names that limit, those names that restrict, those names that marginalize us. And may we live into the names with which God is calling. And no matter what we face, may we listen to God's message in Isaiah. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. 
When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I have called you by name, and you are mine. Amen.